Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is Wisdom Wednesday. Uh, for quite a while now, every Wednesday, uh, we've been studying the book of Proverbs. And now we're all the way up to chapter 14. If you have not seen the previous episodes, then they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I, I hope you will go back and watch those. But today I'm going to pick up with uh, verse 8 in chapter 14. So let me get started. I'm going to look at it in the KJV. I'm a KJV firstist. That, that means that I always look at the KJV first. And uh, if I feel it would may be helpful, then sometimes I look at other translations. But for now, let's look at verse 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of the fools is deceit. Well, uh, I believe that prudent means... Uh, Wisdom, uh, a person who's wise and is applying that wisdom, you're being prudent if you're applying it. So uh, being applying wisdom is prudent, being prudent. And it says is to understand his way. Um, what is his way? Maybe that means your, your purpose, your goal, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, but the folly of the fools is deceit. Deceit. Well, um, as I've said many times before, the book of Proverbs, uh, it's interesting the way it's written because it's very common that it has this kind of contrast. <clears throat> It'll have talk about the wise person is going to get these good results and the foolish person is going to get these bad results. Uh, the wise person behaves in a certain way and the foolish person behaves in an entirely different way. So uh, this is another example. We'll find many more of those as we go through this contrast. Uh, let's look at this in the Amplified and see if it tells me anything else that I'm not getting out of this uh, Amplified. Verse 8 in the Amplified says, The wisdom... That's godly wisdom, which is comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God. Uh, so that's the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of the self-confident fools is to deceive. Uh, Self-confidence. I've talked a lot about being self-centered versus uh, Christ-centered. And... Um, Anytime we put self in front of a word, uh, I think that uh, it's a big mistake. Self-confidence means we're putting our confidence in our own ability. And to be saved, we need to put our confidence in the ability of Jesus to save us. Um, Self-reliant means that uh, you're going to rely on yourself. Like most people think that they get to heaven by, um, by their, their, their self-efforts. And they're relying on that. They're trusting in that. But we know that salvation in the Bible tells us that it's based upon not relying on ourself or our own performance, but relying on Christ. I'm relying completely on Christ for my salvation. Um, Self-esteem. Self-esteem means that you are esteeming yourself. You're thinking highly of yourself. But the scripture tells us that we should not think highly of ourselves. We, that's pride, uh, self-righteousness. Um, we should rather instead be humble. Pride and uh, spiritual pride is the opposite of, of humility. So instead of esteeming ourselves, we need to give all the esteem, all the glory, all the credit to, to Christ. Uh, so I'm sure there's other uh, examples of putting the word self. Uh, um, but um, the important thing here is that in this verse, it says, the folly of the fool is to, is to deceive. Um, deceiving, of course, is just um, 
misleading someone in a way, uh, making them believe something that's untrue. Uh, it's lying. Um, so mo most people understand that lying or deceiving is, is the wrong thing to do. But be today, especially because of moral relativism, a lot of people are not even uh, concerned about right and wrong. They make up their own rules. Um, but the scriptures tells us that um, right and wrong is actually written in our heart. Uh, we're told that uh, even before Israel was established and they had their laws, uh, 613 laws, 10 of which are written in stone, uh, even before that, it, Scripture tells us that man had the, the laws written in his heart. In other words, right and wrong is called conscience. We've all received a conscience. Uh, so we, we know, everybody knows that deceiving people, lying to people, that's wrong. But it seems like it's very gotten popular today to say there is no such thing as right and wrong. It's all relative. It's all a matter of opinion. You can decide for, every person can decide for themselves what is right and wrong. But the Bible tells us that God gave us a conscience, so we all know right and wrong. And then for the Jewish people, he went a step further and said, I'll even put it in a writing for you. <laughs> so if there's no, can be no confusion. Um, okay, let's go to verse 9. We'll go back to the, the KJV. Um, and it says... Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Uh, that kind of, that kind of um, it goes along with what I've just been saying is about moral relativism. It's, it's foolish to think, up, think you can make up your own rules, make up your own uh, standards. Uh, God has established a standard, and he's, he's given us guidelines for our behavior. Uh, and uh, we don't get, we don't get to be our own gods and, and make up our own rules. So it says fools make a mock at sin. If you just dismiss the idea of sin, dismiss the idea that there is uh, black and white, it's not gray, that there is uh, absolute right and absolute wrong. And if you mock at that, that's being a fool. But it says among the righteous there is favor. So again, we always have this contrast between the fool and the righteous, or the fool and the wise, and, and uh, uh, the righteous, there is favor. Well, there, there is a reward for behaving well, uh, doing the right things in life. Uh, Jesus and Paul used the term uh, love, reaping, and sowing. So when we are doing good things, we're going to get good results back. When we're doing bad things, we're going to get bad results coming back to us. In Eastern thought, they call it karma, but this is a law for all humanity that uh, you're going to reap what you sow. So now in verse 10, it says, The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and the stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. Well, this is one of those examples where I think I will um, look at another translation here for a moment. Um, even though I have um, um, a pretty good uh, uh, formal education, uh, and I have a pretty good vocabulary, I, I still find that it, it's not unusual for the, the KJV, since that language is ancient compared to the way we speak English today. I think it can be helpful sometimes to look at some kind of a modern translation, but I have to test it all and compare it to the KJV or, and because that is the standard I trust the most. Um, so let's look at this in the Amplified and see what it says. Um, Okay, uh, verse, the heart knows its own bitterness, 
and no stranger shares its joy. The heart knows its own bitterness and no stranger shares its joy. Well, I'm still at a loss. Let me try that in another translation. Let's try the, uh, uh, let's try the English standard and see what that says. Um, um, well, that's really totally different. It says, fools mock at the guilt offering. Well, the guilt offering would be the um, uh, back in uh, the, under the Mosaic law, the guilt offering was a sacrifice an animal sacrifice that was made. But we know that all these sacrifices and, and the rituals of, of Judaism were just pictures of uh, this future sacrifice that would, God would provide, sacrificing his own son, Jesus Christ, for our sins. So, but fools mock at the guilt offering. Yeah, I mean, it's still very common today that you tell people about uh, how Jesus died for our sins and there are some foolish people I encounter that, that mock that. Uh, and um, most people I encounter, though, they, they are very much aware that they are sinners. And uh, they may not understand that the only solution for that sin is, is Jesus Christ, uh, the payment on the cross for their sins. But they, they do acknowledge that they... They might not even call it sin. They said they make mistakes. They've done some things that they think were wrong. And so however you want to, you know, whatever semantics you use to express it, uh, very few people will say that, no, I don't sin. I've never done anything wrong. I'm perfect. I, I just don't encounter those people. Uh, so it's, it's normal for people to admit that they've done some bad things, but what is unusual is for them, a person to come to the conclusion that they need Jesus. See this shirt here, in case you didn't see it earlier. It says, uh, Jesus, one way to heaven. What's uh, unusual is for a person to uh, agree with that doctrine that, uh, okay, I accept the fact that I've sinned or I've done bad things. And, and uh, if there is a, uh, after life, you know, I uh, I think that maybe I can remedy it on my own through uh, restitution or contrition or changing my life. They think that they can remedy this sin problem. They've done bad things. Well, do they'll do some good things to counteract it or to make up for it? But the scriptures says that that's what your good acts do not erase your your bad acts. Uh, that uh, if you've sinned once, um, then you're guilty. You're a sinner. No matter you know, what you do on your own, you can't ever change that. You need Jesus Christ to be the remedy, the solution. Or as it says here, the guilt offering. But the upright enjoy acceptance. Okay, let's look at go back to the KJV, and I'll look at it again in the verse 10. The heart knoweth his own, no, that was, uh, I'm on verse 11. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. Again, this is the law of reaping and sowing. And in verse 12, it says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Uh, another verse says, God, what, God's ways are not our ways. Uh, for example, one of the most common um, the fallacies throughout all of humanity, throughout all of human history, is what I just talked about, thinking that somehow we can um, solve our sin problem, that it's up to each person to... Uh, uh, you know, do good works to counteract the bad or to or to abstain from bad things and be really good. And, and uh, somehow through your own uh, performance, your own efforts, through personal merit, 
that we can reach a, a, a level where we are deemed acceptable by God. That is the that is the common belief of all humanity that it's up to us to work at it. And then if we get good enough, God will accept us. Uh, so it says, there is a way which seems right unto man. <laughs> and it goes wrong, along with Romans 10, 3, 2. It says that there, the people that misunderstand and think that they can establish their own righteousness, but that's not God's way. Well, God's way is that for us to admit that we can't do that, and therefore, we need the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to us. You get the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to you when you no longer believe in your own righteousness, but instead put your faith in him, in who he is and what he's done for you. So this is an example in verse 12. It says, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Uh, so in the example I've given you, if you insist on holding on to this false doctrine that you can get to heaven through personal merit, through self-righteousness, then the, it says the end of that, uh, the, the, the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, not only do we die physically, but if, if you hold to that false doctrine of uh, working your way to heaven, then you will also have suffer the second death, which and the Bible says that after we die, we, we all get resurrected and go to a judgment. And some people like me who put my faith completely in Jesus, I go to be judged by Christ uh, at what's called the great, the, the, uh, the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm not being judged whether I get to go to heaven and live forever. That's already established and irrevocable. I will just be going, being judged by, uh, to see if I've, deserve any additional rewards because of my ministry, the things I've done. But if, if you never put your faith in Jesus and your whole life continue to believe in your own ability to get to heaven, then you will end up going, getting, being resurrected and going to the another judgment called the Great White Throne Judgment. And that's where everybody who never put their faith in Jesus will be judged they're already lacking. They never received the gift of eternal life. Therefore, they cannot live forever in heaven. The uh, man is born mortal. And it says we put on immortality when we believe in Jesus. If you never believed in Jesus, then you've never received immortality. So you simply get resurrected to go to the judgment and be told this is why you can't be in heaven. This is why you don't have eternal life. You're mortal. You never put your faith in Jesus. And therefore, uh, it, you will end up dying the second death. The second death is the die, death that you die after the resurrect, you're resurrected, after you're judged, after you're uh, found uh, guilty of no faith in Jesus. And then you end up dying the second death. That's in the lake of fire. So you will perish in the lake of fire, and that is the second death. Uh, so in this verse here, it says, the end thereof are the ways of death. Let's look at verse 13. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. I think it's... Um, it, this may be referring to that same person that uh, even uh, even if uh, you think you're having a good time and uh, there's something missing that you, you even in your own conscience and deep in your mind and heart, you know that something's lacking. So you can you can laugh your way through life, but all deep inside you, you're you're always aware that you're lacking this relationship with God. Uh, and, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Um, a backslider, that makes me think of the, uh, uh, the, the proverb or the story of the prodigal son. 
it's commonly called the prodigal son, but in my opinion, the title, uh, the title should be actually the, the word prodigal son is not in the Bible. It's just something that was inserted as kind of a title for that chapter or title for the story. But if I was going to choose a title for that story and a name for the young man, I would call him the backslidden son. You see, uh, it's not just a story about him returning, pro coming back and make, and returning to his father, but it's it's a story about how he he got involved in things that he should never have done. Uh, he was with his father. The father had two sons. The father was very rich, and one of the sons was. Uh, uh, wanted to experience more of life than than he had living here with his with his father. He wanted to go off into the world and experience things. And so his father agreed to give him his inheritance. I imagine it was a lot of money. And so the young man went off with a lot of money. And he got into a lot of mischief. He did a lot of things that he normally would not have done, living there with his father. And. Uh, he was with prostitutes, he, he got into drunkenness, and who knows what else, but he ended up losing all of his money, and and then he was forced to work for someone else, uh, just to, uh, he worked in a pig pen, and he ended up thinking, this is not a good life. I mean, if I was at my, back with my father, uh, I wouldn't have to be, uh, you know, trying to eat, uh, you know, leftover pig food. Instead, I'd be, even if I was a servant, I would be far better off. Um, but but when he was in the pig pen, it's a picture of him sliding down, backsliding, sliding to a state that is uh, is not ideal, is not not the way that his father would like for him to live. And that uh, the boy learned the hard way that it's not a good way to live his life. So he slides into this state that is not desirable, not healthy. And then he ends up uh, coming to a census. He repents. He changes his mind about, well, I thought this would be really good to go off and, uh, you know, experience these things in life. And he realized that it wasn't good. He, he changed his mind about that and decided, you know, it, it's far better to be with his father and live a good life. Uh, so he comes back and his father accepts him. Even before the son could apologize, the father accepts him back and is glad to see him back. So this is a, 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 a backslider. Now, the important thing about the backslider is that the young man, uh, he was the man's son, and nothing that he ever did would change the fact that he's his son. Uh, even though he uh, went and lived in a pig pen, he never actually changed into a pig. He was still the man's son that was just simply living in a pig's pen. So his, um, his uh, standing as the man's son never changed. Uh, and that's the same thing with someone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. We receive salvation as a free gift. It's irrevocable. Even if we decide to go off and uh, you know, not have fellowship with believers, not study our Bibles, not pray, just go off and get into all kinds of mischief and, and our lives, even when they fall apart, we never become the pig even though we may be living like one, we are always the same person in the eyes of God. We are still God's child because when we put our faith in Jesus, scripture says we're born again, we are a child of God. So it's very important we understand this story of the what they call the prodigal son or the backslider, that uh, he didn't lose his salvation, uh, but he certainly learned the hard way that uh, living that kind of a life was not beneficial and he regretted it but he he was always the man's son and the the rich man never turned his back on on his son he uh 
he never denounced him and said that uh, he's no longer a son of mine. No, he was always loved him, always desired for him to come back, and never waited for the son to apologize or, or uh, you know, uh, you know, promise that he was going to change his ways. He laid, never laid out any conditions for his son. He just accepted him back when he came back to him. It's a beautiful story. And the, the reason I'm talking about the backslider here is that in verse 14, Proverbs 14 says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Uh, verse 15, the simple, believe, the simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. The simple believeth every word, <laughs> but the prudent man looketh well to his going. Well, the simple believeth every word. I mean, I, maybe it's talking about the simple. Maybe the person is not really being very thoughtful. I don't think it's necessarily someone has a low uh, intelligence, but a person that's not being thoughtful, not being prudent, and, and uh, is uh, being naive. And uh, he... He believeth every word, every word that you're told. Um, I, I've made this point numerous times this last few months that uh, it's wise to be skeptical about things. Uh, I made a video mainly uh, for the benefit of atheists and evolutionists uh, saying that uh, uh, please don't be ignorant. Because I, I believe that the, the typical atheist and evolutionist is ignorant of the reasons that I, that I could give them that Darwinian evolution is clearly just you know a fable, uh, a fairy tale for adults, uh, absolutely absurd and ridiculous, and to, to believe it, you're you're doing what this person says. It says. The simple believe with every word. These people who believe in evolution, they just believe everything they're told. I mean, the most unbelievable things they just accept because a professor told them or a scientist says it. Uh, they should be skeptical. There's a saying I like, it says skepticism is the antiseptic of the mind. Let's be skeptical about everything. Uh, even be skeptical about the Bible, uh, about Christianity. Be skeptical. I'm not asking anybody just to, to believe without any kind of a study and research, and uh, you, you don't have to have just blind faith. You can study Darwinism, study creationism, just look at the other side, be willing to be educated. When I say, please don't be ignorant to the atheists, I'm, I'm saying, don't be like I was when I was spoon fed uh, Darwinism for, uh, let's say, 16 years of formal education or more I've had and um, all that time they're telling me about Darwinism, Darwinism every year in science classes they're telling me about Darwinism. Well, I just accepted it beca because I was didn't understand the other side. And once I decided to start studying the arguments against Darwinism, the arguments in favor of creationism, then I was no longer ignorant. I heard one side of the story from the school teachers and some scientists, but I never heard the other side of the argument from other scientists and other teachers that once I did showed me that, well, to me, the, the clear choice is uh, God created everything as a finished product. He didn't create us in a way that we evolve piece by piece through Darwinian evolution. Uh, and then, and if you're an atheist, then you, you don't think that God didn't even have a part in that process. You just think that uh, it was just some kind of a, a random chance through uh, with the, using the vehicle of natural selection. So that's all so absurd, but that's an example of this verse here. The simple believeth every word. Don't be naive. Uh, be skeptical. Skepticism is the, is the antiseptic of the mind. And then this quote goes on to say that uh, 
remember why we debate. In other words, I, I'm willing to debate with anybody as far as, uh, okay, let's exchange our ideas. Tell me what you think. I'll give you my answers and uh, I'll listen to you. Will you listen to me? Will we, will we be respectful and courteous to each other and give each other a fair hearing? That's what I consider a healthy debate. And this, this quote I like says, remember why we debate. The only thing we have to lose are the errors we hold. Now, if you were in error, wouldn't you want to know it so you could be corrected? If I'm in error on anything, whether it's theology or uh, science and creation, anything, tell me. I, I, I've been willing to listen to the other side throughout my life, and I've actually had sometimes the other side of a position. I listen to it, and I'm persuaded. I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to consider, will you do the same thing? It says the only thing we have to lose are the errors we hold. Don't you want to lose the errors if you're in error? And the, the final statement of that quote is, uh, who but a stubborn fool would hold on to errors once they've been exposed? So uh, don't be naive and, and ignorant and just accept anything you're told. Do your homework. And the scripture says that there was a group of people that lived in town named Berea. And when the Apostle Paul went there, the people listened to him. And they liked what he said. They wanted to believe it, but they wouldn't believe it without checking it out. They did their homework. They went to the scriptures, the law and the prophets, and looked it through to see if what the Apostle Paul said was really there. And that's called being Berean. So whatever I tell you, Check it out in the Bible for yourself. And uh, whatever any scientist or professor tells you, check out the other side of the argument. Be fair to yourself. I mean, don't be ignorant of the other side of the argument. Then you can make an intelligent decision. But here in Proverbs it says, the simple believeth every word. But the prudent man looketh well to his going. Be prudent. Don't just accept things immediately when you're told them. Uh, Verse 16, a wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. A wise man feareth. Well, what does he fear? It says he departeth from evil. He, he, uh, a wise man understands that if we do evil, even if we are around evil, nothing good comes from it. If you're even around it, it could affect you. If you get involved and participate in it, it will affect you. The law of reaping and sowing will get you. So a wise man fears that uh, you know what's going to happen to him as a consequence from doing the wrong things. But the fool rageth and is confident. The fool doesn't consider any kinds of, uh, you know, have any fear. He just, he just does the wrong things and without even thinking about the consequences. Verse 17, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly and a man of wicked devices is hated. Um, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. Anger can really affect your uh, decision-making ability. Um, the book of James, the verse in the book of James that I like is um, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Uh, unfortunately, I think our nature is exactly the opposite of that. Uh, we don't want to be quick to listen. We, we, we're slow to listen. It says, be slow to speak. Well, no, most people are not going to be patiently sitting there just listening and listening and holding their mouth and listening and considering. They're, instead, they don't want to listen. Instead, they want to talk. They're quick to talk instead of slow to speak. You'll learn a lot more if you listen instead of talking all the time. And then it says... Be slow to anger. Uh, if you get anger, 
easily, angered easily. You're quick to anger, quick to wrath. Then uh, not only are you going to hurt other people, but uh, it's going to come back and bite you too. You won't be able to think clearly. You won't be wise. You'll make bad decisions and you'll do things that maybe someday you will regret. At least there will be consequences. And it says, uh, a man of wicked devices is hated. If you're doing wicked things, then people will hate you. It's, it's not my goal, though, on the other hand, to, to be loved by everybody. Jesus said that those of us who love him and believe in him, we're going to be hated by the world. So because of my faith in Jesus, I, I don't expect everybody to love me. I know that many people are going to hate me because they hated him. And they many people today hate the name Jesus. And uh, because I, uh, I uh, embrace Jesus and I, I am identified with him as a Christian, one who relies completely on Christ, one who believes completely on Christ for my salvation, then uh, I, I'm going to suffer. I have suffered uh, because of that. So I know that uh, I don't expect everybody to love me, but I do expect that I'm going to try to love everybody because Jesus said that is, that's what he really asks of us. Um, he says, he says, if you're trying to be religious and follow all the religious rules and something, he said, don't forget about that. I'm just going to condense it into one simple premise. That is, will you just love each other? So rather than trying to get everybody to love me, uh, I'm more concerned about, I want to love you. It's not always easy, though, because there are some people when you are um, hated and mistreated by people, then it, it's, it's hard to love them. But that's the difference between Jesus and Muhammad. You know, Muhammad says, tells to cut off their heads. Jesus says, turn, up, turn the other cheek. Muhammad says that you, uh, you, you kill them and you, and you, and you tax them and you, uh, you force them into slavery. Jesus says, no, you love your enemies. So, um, a man of wicked devices is hated. Um, the verse 18, the simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Folly means that, uh, you know, it's just, you're going to, you're going to just make mistakes. You're going to make big blunders in life. Um, whether it's you're, um, you're making uh, some kind of an investment and you do not take your time to study it and see how you know, it's protected. You just, you just, uh, as it says earlier, uh, the simple believe with every word. Someone tells you to in, invest in them and you just believe every word and you invest and you end up getting a folly. You get failure. Uh, or the folly could be just other bad things, whether you you do things and it affects your health or it, it affects your finances or it affects your relationships. But the simple in, inherit folly, in, inherit problems in your life. But the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Prudent is uh, you are applying wisdom to your life. Uh, verse 19, the evil bow before the good and the wicked at the gates of and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The evil bow before the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. Uh, let me look at that in the Amplified, verse 19. Um, 
the evil men bow before the good, and the wicked stand suppliantly at the gates of the uncompromisingly righteous. Well, it doesn't always work out that way immediately, but we know eventually that it will be the outcome that uh, good prevails in the end. Unfortunately, though, there's a lot of good people that are uh, have bad things happen to them, and there's a lot of Christians that, uh, uh, even though they put their faith in Christ and they are assured, guaranteed eternal life in, in heaven, the, their their lives are are not so beautiful and wonderful and just blessed all the time. Uh, as someone said to me that uh, didn't Jesus come and just say to I came to give life and give it more abundantly well yeah but sometimes the, the abundant things we get are an abundance of persecutions uh, take the apostle Paul uh, he said that he ran off a list of things bad things that happened to him because of his faith he says, I was, not, I was beaten with rods three, three times. I was received 39 lashes you know, three or four times. Uh, I was stoned and left for dead. Uh, he was shipwrecked and bit by a poisonous snake. Uh, and then, you know, eventually, uh, his faith led to his demise. He, he lost his head. He was executed by Rome. So did the apostle Paul have an abundant life? Well, he has treasures in heaven far more than probably maybe anybody else. I can't think of any Christian throughout history that I would rate more highly than Paul in terms of how he's contributed to, to uh, the kingdom of God, how much he's done for all of us. Uh, and yet, so I, in heaven, I'm sure that he has his rewards, but while he lived, he suffered. So when it says evil men bow before the good and the wicked stand suppliantly at the gates of the uncompromising or righteous, uh, that may not happen uh, every time and that may not happen uh, right in, immediately in this lifetime either. Uh, verse, let's go to verse 20. Uh, look at verse 20 on the Amplified while I'm here. The poor is hated even by his own neighbor, but the rich has many friends. Well, you might think that, uh, why would someone hate the poor? Well, be, because they don't have anything to offer them. They, they can't buy them gifts. They can't invite them over for dinner. They can't do them all kinds of favors. They can't give them money if someone is, uh, is, is needs something. Poor can't give those things. So the world really has no use for the poor. So it's hated or or looked down upon and thought they're just, it's a waste of breath, air for them even breathing is how some people see the poor. But the rich have many friends. You have a lot of friends if you're rich, but are they true friends? Are they friends because they are, truly want to be your friend with no um, ulterior motives? Or are they being your friends because you're rich and they can gain by being your friends. They can gain favors. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the, back to the KJV here. Okay. Verse 21, he that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, 
but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Now, Jesus said that we will always have the poor with us. And I, I, I think that certainly must apply to in this world, but not in the world to come, not in the uh, um, life everlasting, not in the, the, the kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth, where we will live through eternity. Uh, but until that time, we'll always have poor people with us, no matter where, whether we have um, uh, capitalism or communism, or no matter if we have democracy or republics or, or, or uh, um, monarchies or oligarchies, or, it doesn't matter what economic system, it doesn't matter what form of government and leadership we have, we're, we're going to always have poor people. Uh, but what do people think of the poor? Uh, he that despises his neighbor sinneth, but he that have mercy on the poor, he is happy. So uh, we, we should, uh, if we apply the law that Jesus gave us, love your neighbor, love each other then if you love someone, as Paul said, that uh, uh, love does not wrong others. Wrong does not speak badly of others. Wrong does not do th bad things to others. If we just follow this law of love, then uh, you're certainly going to have mercy on the poor. Verse 22, do they not err that devise evil? but mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. So it's wrong to do evil things or plan evil things. Mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. If you make plans to do good things, then you will get mercy and truth. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. In all labor there is profit. Uh, the work ethic, being, a, being having the attitude that uh, you're going to uh, not be lazy, slothful, a sluggard, as it says in, in Proverbs, but you're going to be diligent and uh, hardworking. And, well, if you are like that, then you won't go hungry. If you, if you are like that, you will be prosperous if, as long as you're honest and hardworking. Uh, but it says that... Um, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Now, I don't know what the word penury means. Let me look at that in the Amplified, see if it helps. Okay. Um, he who despises his neighbor's sins against God, his fellow man, and himself. But happy or blessed and fortunate is he who is kind and merciful to the poor. Okay, that was verse 21. I'm wrong verse. We're in verse 22. It says, Do they not err who devise evil and wander from the way of life? But loving kindness and mercy, loyalty and faithfulness shall be to those who devise good. I guess penury is someone who's devising bad, but you know, devise good, devise is plan and make an effort, make an effort to do good things. Not because you can uh, uh, earn heaven through your efforts, because that's impossible. The only way we get to go to heaven is putting our faith in Jesus rather than our own efforts. But when we do good things, we help other people. We're showing our love and kindness and uh, we, we will get good things coming back to us too. Uh, the reward of, the, of doing these good things in this life, uh, that should not be the motivation. Uh, it should just be done out of love because it's the right thing to do. Uh, uh, there's a saying, doing the right thing is its own reward. 
verse 23. Oh, I keep on skipping the, one of the wrong verses. It says, in all labor there is profit, but idle talk leads only to poverty. Idle talk. That's just, you know, wasting time. Brother Jack Smack likes to talk about that. You know, if you're spending all your time watching television, and watching sports, doing things that are not really not profitable. I mean, there is a place for leisure. There is a time for recreation uh, um, and uh, things that are, are not necessarily uh, laborious, but, but working, labor. Uh, if we're hard workers, we're going to get farther in life financially. If we work at our health instead of being slothful and lazy and uh, drunkards, then we're going to work at that. We're going to get health in return. Uh, but idle talk, just being lazy, sitting around talking about nothing, maybe gossiping, it, it, you get poverty. It's poverty financially and poverty of your soul. Verse 24, the crown of the wise is their health of wisdom, is their wealth of wisdom, but the foolishness of self-confident fools is nothing but folly. Oh, I'm back on the Amplified. Let me go to the KJV, for verse 24. Um, the crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. Verse 25, a true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. A true witness delivereth souls. Well, that's my endeavor. That's what I hope to accomplish. Studying the book of Proverbs, much of it is about uh, living a good life so that you can have a good life. Uh, doing the right thing so you get good things coming back to you. But, but also much of it is, is about salvation. And so many of these verses lead me into a salvation message because it says, here, a true witness delivereth souls. Well, delivereth souls, that means you save souls. Or you deliver the souls to God, and you, or you're delivering them in terms of saving them from uh, the second death in the lake of fire. And only a true witness can do that. A true witness. A true witness is someone who's telling you the truth about God, about salvation. And how do I determine what is true? This is the test, the scriptures. And if somebody says something and I check it out and say, that's not what it's not in the Bible. In fact, the Bible even contradicts it. Then I would say, that's a false witness. A lot of people are too willing to just accept what they're being told by somebody without checking the scriptures to see if it's, if it's so. Um, and, and then there are some people that go by their own intuition or what they believe is the Holy Spirit leading them into conclusions. But we've got to test the spirits too because it may not be the Holy Spirit. It could be uh, a strange spirit that is there to mislead you. So even if you hear this, Paul says, even if you have an angel appear to you, if they tell you something that contradicts the scriptures, then, then it, the message is cursed. And I can think of two people, very famous people, who they say had angels appear to them. In fact, the same angel, Gabriel. Joseph Smith claims that he had Gabriel appear to him. I'm, I'm sorry, Moroni. It was the angel Moroni. <laughs> you know, Joseph Smith was a was a uh, proven to be a con man and a scammer before he established his false religion. But uh, 
it just seems to me like it's it's almost like a, he's laughing in the face of all the, the Mormons when he said the name of the angel was Moroni, M-O-R-O-N, moron, with an I on the end, moron. You have to be a moron to believe what Joseph Smith said. It totally contradicts what we learn in the Bible. And yet he says he learned it because an angel gave him these golden plates with this, this new knowledge. Uh, same thing happened with the, the false teacher they call Muhammad. He claims that he got his information from an angel named Gabriel. And yet what he wrote down is totally contradicts the Bible. It says that God has no son. It says that he, Jesus did not die on the cross. It says that we're not, we're not, Jesus is merely a prophet, not the son of God. It says salvation is done through works rather than faith in Christ. So uh, we must test things. Even if an angel appears to you, test it to see if what they told you agrees with the scriptures. Um, so a true witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. I gave you an example of two deceitful witnesses, Muhammad and Joseph Smith. There's many more around today. There's thousands and thousands of them that I find on YouTube. Verse 26, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. And his children shall have a place of refuge. Okay. In the fear of the Lord, well, we could fear the Lord in terms of knowing that what if we don't do what the Lord tells us to do in the scriptures, there will be bad consequences in the life. Uh, the fear of the Lord could also be respect or reverence for the Lord. If we respect and revere the Lord and want to want to listen to him, then we can be confident because it's God himself that's guiding us. And his children shall have a place of refuge. Verse 27, uh, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. And the word fear, as I just said, can mean the, the respect, adoration, reverence uh, for God. Um, and also fear of the consequences if we don't listen to God, because he's, he's not telling us to do the right things and avoid doing the wrong things because he's trying to be a, like just you know, a party pooper. He's telling us those things because he knows what's best for us. And he knows when we do the wrong things, then they know that we're going to get poverty, bad health. Uh, people will want to murder us. If you do the bad things, you're going to get bad, res bad results back. And that's what God really wants to know. So it's wise to respect and revere God and his word and follow it. Uh, verse 28, in the multitude of people is the king's honor. But in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. I don't know what that means. Let's look at Amplified, see if it helps. This is uh, verse 28. It says, um, In a multitude of people is the king's glory. But in a lack of people is the prince's ruin. Well, I mean, if a king doesn't have any people in his kingdom, you know, that would be not good at all. What kind of king has no people living in his kingdom? No, no uh, what, is, what is it called? Uh, uh, not servants, but uh, there, there's a word for people who live under a king. It says, and a multitude of people is the king of glory. So a king has a lot of people in his kingdom. It's glorious. In the, but in a lack of people is the prince's ruin. So if everybody leaves that kingdom, no one wants to follow that king, that will enter uh, and finally come to ruin. Verse 29, 
He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is hasty of spirit exposes and exalts his folly. That's what we said earlier, and it's it's repeated because when things are repeated, it, tell, it emphasizes how important it is. Verse 30, a calm and undisturbed mind and heart are the life and health of the body, but envy, jealousy, and wrath are like rottenness of the bones. Uh, again, you know, as I said before, many times you have a contrast presented in these verses. On one hand, we have a calm, undisturbed uh, mind and heart, and that is, uh, uh, it leads to, to a good life and health. And, but on the other hand, you have people who have envy, jealousy, and wrath. It leads to rottenness in their bones. Rottenness in their bones just means bad health. You're going to get bad things will happen to you, whether it's uh, someone wants to murder you because of revenge or because you you uh, did a lot of bad things and now uh, your your health is is failing because of the decisions you've made, how you'd live your life. So um, envy, jealousy, wrath, that's anger. If you're an angry person, you're envious, you're jealous. Uh, and who of us have not had these qualities to a, at least a certain extent in our lives? And hopefully as we when we put our faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives inside us and starts transforming us, hopefully our ways change so that our, our thoughts and our actions are not from envy, jealousy, and anger, but instead we're calm, undisturbed, we have peace and love. Verse 32, no, 31. He who oppresses the poor reproaches, mocks and insults his maker, but he who is kind and merciful to the needy honors him. So if, not just for the sake of the poor, but, but, to, but to please God, we should love the poor, help the poor, and rather than mock them, because if you mock the poor, you're insulting God who, who made us all. Verse 32, the wicked is overthrown through his wrongdoing and calamity, but the consistently righteous has hope and confidence even in death. Yeah. Um, so, in other words, um, you know, the wicked, you know, when you do bad things, evil things, you're not going to get away with it eventually. Maybe not immediately like that. There may not be a consequence, but eventually it will catch up with you. But uh, if you're doing the right things, you have hope and confidence in life and even in death. The only thing that's truly righteous is to put your faith in Jesus Christ and that way you receive his righteousness, which is imputed to you because of your faith in him. And then because of that righteousness, you get to go to heaven because of your faith in Jesus. Verse 33, wisdom rests silently in the mind and heart of him who has understanding but he that which is in the inward part of self-confident fools is made known back on amplified let me go to the kjv again here okay Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath understanding, but that which is in the midst of fools is made known. Verse 34, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I'm really become quite embarrassed and ashamed of the state of my nation the United States of America. We, we've changed so much for the worst. I mean, oh, we have technology and that's a blessing. We have abundance of food and, and we have all kinds of things like that, but we have moral decay and uh, a, a lot of people who've 
turn to themselves and just pleasure rather than embracing God, embracing Jesus Christ. Um, and that way we have had this come to pass. Righteousness exalted as nation. But instead of our nation being exalted with righteousness, it's not that there are not, there's not some righteousness. The righteousness is in Christians because we have the righteousness of Christ. But how many Christians are there in the United States? Uh, I estimate that only maybe 2% of a population are really Christians, really believe in Christianity the way that we learn from the Bible. They're, then you have a large number of people that they don't believe in God at all. They reject it. Some people are not even sure. They're agnostic. They don't have a, a faith, but they're not necessarily uh, convinced that God does not exist. And you've got a lot of people who are from all different kinds of religions, even various sects of Christianity that uh, say they believe in God. They say they believe in Christianity, and yet they never really put their faith in Jesus. They're still trying to get to heaven on their own efforts. When, it, when you whittle it all down, you probably have a tiny percentage of Americans who are Christians, who, who answered the question correctly. The question is, do you believe you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Start asking that question to everybody you know. Do you believe you will go to heaven? And if so, why? And you'll probably find that almost everybody tells you, well, if there is a heaven, I think I'll probably go because I'm a good person. They're, they're uh, justifying their place in heaven by their goodness. They think that if they're religious enough, if they do enough good things, that God will accept them. They think it's, we get heaven through personal merit. And that's the biggest lie ever told. How many of those people will answer the question the correct way, which is, yes, I am going to heaven because Jesus Christ is my savior. He promised me eternal life in heaven if I put my faith in him and I believe him. Period. Period. Ask the question, how many will believe that they're justified by because of their faith in Jesus, not in their own personal merit? Well, not many Americans believe that. Not many people in the world believe that, but that's what the Bible says. Uh, then final verse here, verse 35, the king's favor is toward a wise servant. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causeth shame. So the king it could be in a kingdom. It could also be referring to the king of kings, Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're a wise servant, you know, uh, we expect that he's going to bless us more. Uh, if we're uh, not a wise servant, uh, then, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to receive his, his blessings. Instead, the scripture says that we receive um, chastisement. So the scripture tells us that if you're a child of God, because of your faith in Jesus, uh, God chastises his children. When we misbehave, we get disciplined. Um, we don't go to hell because we're promised eternal life in heaven. But sometime in this life, God will uh, find a way to correct us and discipline us. So it is wise to uh, do the right things. We have the law of reaping and sowing that will get us. We also have the chastisement of God that will correct us. So the wise thing to do is Let's do the right things in life instead of the wrong things. And we will reap good things if we sow good things. All right, so that's the conclusion of uh, chapter 14. Uh, the final thing I want to tell you is uh, something I've been mentioning throughout this study is, is about heaven. 
uh, do you want to go to heaven? If you do, and it may seem like a strange question. I've asked some people that question, and they don't want to go to heaven. They don't believe in heaven, or they say, I'd rather go to hell. That's where my friends are. Well, if that's what you want, fine. Maybe someday you'll change your mind and you'll say, I do want to go to heaven. And I'm going to tell you how to get there. There's only one way. You cannot get to heaven by climbing a ladder and striving and enduring and persevering and being doing good and thinking that somehow through your efforts you're going to get there. Reject that. You can only get to heaven by admitting failure, admitting hopelessness and say, I cannot do it. I don't deserve it. No matter how good I, 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 I try to be, I, I fall short of perfection. And that's why I need to be saved. Jesus said he's the savior of the world. And being saved means that you don't go into the lake of fire and suffer the second death. You're saved from that. Instead, you get to live in heaven. You have eternal life in heaven forever. And how do you get that? You get it simply by putting in your faith in Jesus instead of yourself. Now, I want you to know who he is and what he did. Jesus is God Almighty. He's eternal. He, was, he doesn't have a beginning. doesn't have an end. He's not created. He's eternal. And the Bible says that he loves us so much that he became a man so that he could die for our sins. He couldn't die if he remained just God. So God became a man in order to die. He died for our sins on a cross. And the Bible says when he was on that cross, all our sins were charged to him. He suffered and died for your sins and for mine. That's how much he loves you. So he's paid for our sins. Now he says, I, I will give you life everlasting if you put your faith in me. And, and to prove to us that he's able to do that, after he died and was buried, on the third day, he raised himself from the dead. He said that was the sign he would give us so that we can be justified in putting our faith in him. So uh, the cross is what paid for our sins. The resurrection is what should give you confidence to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. If he can raise himself from the dead, he can raise me uh, the last day and, and give me eternal life in heaven, it's, it's just as he promised. So I'm going to trust him. I'm not going to try to do this on my own. I admit I'm a failure. I can't be perfect. That's biblical Christianity. And it's important for you to know that if you put your faith in Jesus right now, that it is irrevocable. It's not, it's irreversible. You can, once you put your faith in him, it's a, it's an instantaneous thing that happens. It's not a process that happens throughout your life where you're trying to, hoping that if you continue living good, that he'll, he'll still give, it's not based on that at all. It's based on an instantaneous decision that you make that you're going to trust him to get you to heaven. And once it happens, it's irreversible, no matter what. So you can be confident and joyful because you have this, what we call blessed assurance. You're assured your place in heaven because you believe in Jesus Christ. Do it now. Receive the gift of eternal life today. Thank you for watching. Join me every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.